I'm going to read a poem that for a lot of fans of Wallace Stevens is a favorite. I'm going to read it, and then we'll talk about it. It's called Large Red Man Reading, and it's another one of these poems about by poets about reading. Something, what, it, what is it about? Dave, speculate. Why do poets, and modern poets in particular, like they're so interested in the act of reading? Shouldn't they be interested in the act of writing? Well, I mean, they're writing for people to read their work. They're thinking about how their work is going to be read. So a lot of their writing is really focused on, you know, at some level, thinking about the reading. So, Kamara, riff a little further on that. What, what, when you read the poem of a poet who is reading, there's a kind of re annoying recursive thing going on because mm -hmm. you're reading a book uh, about a poet who's reading a book. Um... I don't know. Um, I think there is um, some type of communication that goes on in that type of process. Um, not sure what, but there, there, there seems to be some type of union going on there. A union. Okay, cool. So I'm going to read the poem and then we'll talk about this kind of reader. Large red man reading. There were ghosts that returned to earth to hear his phrases. As he sat there reading aloud the great blue tabulae. They were those from the wilderness of stars that had expected more. There were those that returned to hear him read from the poem of life, of the pans above the stove, the pots on the table, the tulips among them. There were those that would have wept to step barefoot into reality, that would have wept and been happy, have shivered in the frost and cried out to feel it again, have run fingers over leaves and against the most coiled thorn, have seized on what was ugly and laughed. As he sat there reading from out of the blue tabu from out of the purple tabulae, the outlines of being and its expressings, the syllables of its law, poesis, poesis the literal characters, the Vatic lines, which in those ears and in those thin, those spended hearts took on color, took on shape, and the size of things as they are, and spoke the feeling for them, which was what they had lacked. Uh, Dave, react to the sound of the reading of that poem for a second. It's very difficult. It, it's not smooth and flowing, but it, you have to be very conscious of each syllable. You can't just read it casually. You have to really focus in, and the sounds are sometimes halting. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it makes you hyper-conscious of the reading. Lily, what gives you the most trouble with this poem? Definitely the grammar um, in terms of how there's like three different signaling orthography things. So there's like a grammatical sentences with capital letters and periods, then there's line breaks, and then there's stanza breaks. And all three are like signaling to me as I read at once and making it, it just makes it confusing to even understand who's the subject of what verb, where, and when. Um, and these are long, in and, terms of sentences, yeah. they're very long. And in, in, in terms of actual grammar at the level of the line, you have all kinds of conditionals. Mm -hmm. There were those that would have wept. Mm -hmm. Would have wept. In other words, if they ever stepped barefoot into reality, they would have wept. Those that returned to hear him and read, hear him read from the poem of life, they would, there were those that would have wept, that would have wept and been happy, etc. Mm -hmm. um, Kamara, what's hardest for you in dealing with this? Um, no, I think it's paying attention to the subjects, um, who they are the whole time and following that throughout the whole poem. The first time I read it, I, I got lost on who was who and I had to go back and read it multiple times to figure out where the ghosts were. Yeah. <laughs> so are the ghosts in the first line the they of the third line? Presumably so, right? Mm -hmm. So why would ghosts come and return to earth to hear presumably the reader 
or the poet may be reading one of his own books. So one imagines Wallace Stevens reading in a chair one of his own books aloud to whom? Dave? Ghosts? What, what, what's going on here? I is think, this sci-fi? I think the key to that is the end of the first stanza that, that had expected more. These ghosts had expected more of the afterlife. Hmm. So it makes you think that these people, when they were living life, they were living thinking, it's all going to be there in the afterlife. Hmm. But it turns out, maybe not. Is it possible that their disappointment is about how they expect, if they're going to come all the way from heaven down to earth to listen to this guy's poems, they wanted the poems to be better? Is he chastising himself humorously? I didn't get that from Lily. Him. Well... I think, I don't know, I think he might be chastising them for the more that they're expecting. I think that the th that what they want from the large red man reading, who we just equated to Stevens, um, is something that maybe, the, this just the, the only reason that makes me think that is the careful phrasing of the poem to like not include basically anything about the man reading himself seems to be all about what they want and what they expect which makes me think it might not be what the large red man reading has or, or um, is, is happy to provide. What does poetry read provide those from another place or those who enter the space of poetry? What, what does it offer them? I mean, not in this poem, but generally, what would you say, Kamara? What, if, if I enter a space of poetry, what, what should I get from it? Um, Huge question. Either a sort of escape into a different sort of mindset, right. or um, a real, almost like a, a fact checker, checker on reality. <laughs> I see like both types, I see that in both senses. So Dave, if, if the ghosts return, presumably they're unreal and they live in unreality, and they're trying to get the passion of terrestrial life, pots and, and pans, pots and pans. Um, why would they, why wouldn't they just go into the kitchen? Why would they want to read, watch a man reading poems? It well, seems like they're getting a secondary glimpse of reality. Rather than just experiencing the reality, they're, they're trying to get somebody telling them about reality, you're saying. And a poet. But not a novelist, yeah. not, a, not Charles Dickinson, sorry, Charles Dickens, but Wallace Stevens. Yeah, I think that the, the best way to get reality, I mean, according to this poem, it's to be expressed through poetry, poesis. It, it, it gives the, the more direct connection for these ghosts to the natural world, to living in the natural world. So, Lily, um, you said before accurately that there, we know very little, bit, uh, uh, very little about the man who's reading. What do we know? We know that he's large mm -hmm. and he's red for some reason. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting as he reads because in the fourth stanza he sits there reading. Although that could be idiomatic. Like you could be standing and sat there reading at the right. same time. But, right. And he starts with a great blue tabula, tabulae and ends with purple tabulae um, mm -hmm. and that he is reading s only I think at the fourth stanza do we actually get a description of what is being read the yes. first three seem to be their expectations of what they're coming hoping right. to find so right. It's outlines of being... So that counts simple, as simple. information about him, right. since it seems to be what he himself wrote. So what kind of writing does he himself do? It says outlines of being and its expressings. So the, it would be existence so, uh, and the expressions and, of existence, the, um, the effect of existence mm -hmm. and, um, in words. And, and it says um, the syllables of its law, poesis, poesis, the literal character, so there's something like literal, verbal, just like the sound of of language and um, expression. Mm -hmm. uh, less less about the content of what he's. Why reading. law? Why would we ever associate the word law, Kamara, 
with poetry? The syllables of its law is a tough question, too. Um, I'm thinking about what rules poetry has, and I'm getting stopped. <laughs> yeah. um, How about if we think about law in other senses? I mean, I think rules and constraints, like in this case, you start a new line, you put a capital letter, but what other kind of law do we have in relation to writing? Dave? We're talking you know about something about the law. <laughs> um, are you talking about rules of, of grammar, or about I communication? Don't I don't know. Really? Yeah, and then also like tabulae is intentionally very archaic. It almost reminds me of like Hammurabi's code or something it's like that. The plural in plural of tablets, law. right? Which so any, something that had to be any had laws been. on tablets. Oh. Well, yeah, but I guess like. So these are not just not, rules of grammar, but commandments, uh, yeah, right? And when we talk about tabulae, we think of the tabula rasa. Mm -hmm. Right, and of mm -hmm. course, if you're a poet, you are writing on a blank sheet, and mm -hmm. you're creating law, poesis, poesis. Why say it that way? What is, what is poesis? It's Greek. And what does it and mean? Isn't it the root of poetry? It is, is it? the root of the word poetry, and it means to make, to make. Why emphasize making in this context? He super emphasizes it because he says poesis, poes, poesis, comma, poesis repeated, comma, the literal characters, which, which makes me think like, it, I actually picture the, the purple colored stone he has just says poesis on it. Yeah. That's like yeah. what he's The reading. poem seems um, to be poesis. <laughs> and boy, what a poem it is. Yeah. I tried to read it in my reading. Uh, poesis, poesis. Yeah. It's, it's, um. So if, if if those are the literal characters, poesis, like as you suggest, Lily, mm -hmm. that what's on this tabula is the word poetry. Talk about metapoetic. <laughs> the literal characters, characters are alphabetical pieces, letters, mm -hmm. the Vatic lines. Vatic means? Predicts the future. Yeah. So these are prophetic lines. Poesis, poesis, make, make, the law, which, the characters, the lines, which, in those ears, who's? I think ghosts. Yeah, he's reading aloud to ghosts, or he's reading aloud to listeners who come from unreality to reality, and he says, make, make, poetry, poetry, and in those ears, and in those thin, those spended hearts, why are they spended? Ghosts, they're dead, I guess. Yeah. I, I guess mean, sus like either. suspended, right? Like spended or, is such or a great spended, word. Like spent, but doesn't really spent. mean yeah. yeah, of spent, life. right? So these are like ghostly figures. These are thin, uh, not real people. And when you say poesis, poesis, in those ears and in those thin, spended hearts, those characters took on color and shape and the size of what? Things as they are. That's Wallace Stevens' way of saying reality. Mm -hmm. Pots and pans. Things. No ideas, but in things. Pots, pans. Now think about it. Poesis, poesis. It almost says to make. It doesn't say to theorize. It doesn't say to abstract. It says to make. So this is a poetry of reality, the pots and pans-ness of life. And those ghostly figures with, with that, not much left of passion, they took on color. They took on shape, right? Or it's the syllables, as heard, become real. And then, as they, things as they are, and spoke the feeling for them. Why, in some literal sense, do the ghosts need to have the poems speak the feeling for them? just to stick to this little story. They're ghosts, they can't usually speak for themselves. Right, so they're, it is a little sci-fi. Yeah. So they've come back and they're, they're, they're deriving their humanity from feelings that have been written down. Lily, you were gonna say something. Um, I guess I'm just conf like, uh, confused at um, who's being celebrated, whose mode is being celebrated if anyone's if that makes sense, because is is the speaker saying that um, 
the ghosts have sort of correctly interpreted Poes because they've made a big jump as listeners, I guess, to just just go from the literal characters of Poesis, Poesis, to creating all of this pots and pans and stoves and stuff, like things that they are now incapable of experiencing. Um, so let's translate that first question into a question for the three of us. Well, okay, so is ultimately by the end of the poem, does the speaker s side with or celebrate the reading indicated by the final stanza that the ghosts seem to have done, on, or, or the listening that they seem to have done to his reading? Okay. Like, does he celebrate or side with what they say? Dave, answer to, to Lily's question. I think it's suggesting that the, the reading, the poesis, is the direct connection to the materiality of the world. That's what, what these ghosts lack. They lack the experience of the material world. They long for it. And poetry is the direct way to get to that, to that natural world. Kamara? I think what he's saying is that the ghosts are lacking, yes, the living, the reality, but the process of living. And I think that's where they gain their like feeling per se, is this um, is from the poet who's talking about living and the process of finding and the process of creation, which they obviously can't do anymore because they can't really create anything anymore. What do they have? What's the closest thing they have to reality? I guess it's his poem. Yeah. They came to hear him read from the Poem of Life. By the way, that has a very pretentious quality to it, the Poem of Life. But what he really means is the Poem of Actuality, the Pots and Pans. It is the Poem of Life of, meaning the poems of, the pans above the stove. This is not the pans above the stove. This is the poem of the pans above the stove. I have an observation about that, though, because we... we we talk about that as the blue tabula, and then we later talk about it as the purple tabula. I think you could read that as saying that... They're getting some color. Yeah, they're reflecting. They're, they're having an interplay and exchange. They reflect red. They reflect the red man, literally and figuratively. They begin to take on some of his livingness, some of his terrestriality. They would have wept would have wept to step barefoot in reality. It's a famous line. Let's see if we can spend a little more time with it and then we'll wrap up. So, just getting away from this particular poem, if somebody said to you, Kamara, I would have wept to step barefoot into reality. What, what does that mean? I would have broken down. I would have been vulnerable. Um, I would have been scared. To do what, to, though? Um, Step barefoot into reality means what? Be, um, just... Why do you take your shoes off if you want to go into reality? You want to and feel the sand. You want to feel what's actually going on. You want to live in the moment, I guess. You want to um, stand on the real ground, make contact. Dave, step barefoot into like reality. Your mainlining sensory perception. You want to, <laughs> you want to get as much of it as you can, as pure as you can, and as raw as you can. And why would these ghosts have wept to do that? Because they, we really want some kind of corporeality. We want to. I keep using the word terrestrial. We want contact, and they're not making contact. Their closest contact is the poems of life by this guy, this red man reading. Lily? Well, is meta poetry going to keep us further from reality, even though this is arguing that it gets us closer? Well, but that's sort of what I'm like, I, I don't, I think that um, they're, they're, they want poetry to reflect, directly reflect experience, it seems like. And I don't think a meta poem always does that, like reflect experience directly. It's more about like putting a barrier between. Famously, yeah. Right. So indirect, unresponsive to like, life, unreal. Yeah, it seems like they, that's what they don't want. They it seems like they don't want a meta poem. They want like a oh. traditional lyric sort of or something. So or why? Like, so, right, they the ghosts. The ghosts meaning yeah. like I, 
I, I want some reality. I want to, you know, not only step barefoot in reality, but like I want to stomp on grapes. Yeah, like I want to feel, purple. I want to <laughs> I want to read what you've written and f feel like I'm there is kind of the cliched way that we would say it. Like, So what is Stephen saying? Because he's giving them something different. Well, he just gave them poesis, poesis, and they took seemingly, I mean, maybe, maybe not, but it seems like the, that what, what we said before, like the first three stanzas is all what they wanted and describing them, their characteristics. Um, and then he only gives them the literal characters of the word poesis, which is super, like the most super, super meta poem ever. Um, and they <laughs> take on color, take shape. The, they see things as they are seemingly like for themselves and spoke feeling for them. The so, poem spoke feeling for them. Yeah. yeah. So he's, instead of giving them the pots and pans of life, he gave them the meta poem of life. Instead of giving them, <laughs> so let's, let's restate that. Instead okay. of giving them the pots and pans of life, right. he gave them the word pot and the word pan. Yeah, the literal characters. The literal characters. And the, the word pot just sounds like reality. The word pan, a little less so. I think of the god pan, which there is the go. god. Maybe so. Great outdoors. And the words poesis, poesis, which are not things, but meta things, the making of things. Hmm. Poesis, poesis. He's taking s the sound that a mouth makes mm -hmm. and commenting on the preciousness of our physical reality that only when we're no longer here on the earth, right, do we realize how much we will miss, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what they had lacked was the very thing that we take for granted most, especially if we're metapoetic types like Wallace Stevens. Stevens said, the greatest poverty is not to live in a physical world. In another poem, uh, he said, I think it's in the Auroras of Autumn, he said, we, this is the, like the happiest that Stevens ever gets. We were as Danes in Denmark all day long, <laughs> which is a really weird thing to say. What do you think he means by that? We were as Danes in Denmark all day long. What are Danes? People in Denmark. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes me think of like when in Rome, I guess. Except it's that. like when in Rome do like the Romans, yeah, except what he's, he's saying there. is he we were there. so where we needed to be. We were so in the place yeah. that was appropriate and all day long suggests that longing for the preciousness of physical reality. All right, final words about this unusual poem about a poet who's figuring himself apparently reading poems and having listeners be those who have no sense of reality and rather than showing them down to the kitchen he gives them a poem that has pots and pans in it. Dave, final thoughts? Well, these ghosts that are the subject of the poem that he's trying to hold the hand of, I mean, they didn't appreciate life. They didn't, they missed it all. So. He's and died giving, too young, I suppose. Yeah, and he's giving them, they can't, they're ghosts, so he can't really give them experience anymore. They can't experience it, but the best way to hold their hands and bring people or ghosts who haven't experienced the physical world is through poesis. He's, it, it's a form of hand-holding, of getting them into this natural experience. Hand-holding, guiding them into the making of the world. And the making of the world is not the world. It's the poem. The poem does the making of the world. The world is the world. The poem makes the world. That was almost my final word. Lily, final thoughts? I don't know. I, I, so I think I like that he sort of foils the expectation of the listener or the reader by not quite giving them what they want, but more like what they need, what they had lacked, like the ability to create that for themselves rather than just delivering to them the, the fake thing of what they lacked, which would be like to try to directly describe experience for them to like absorb. But I think he undercuts it a little bit by kind of clapping himself on the back for doing so by writing this poem called The Large Red Man Reading and like very pointedly um, allowing himself to be so, uh, so well understand that the words he's saying take on color and shape and like celebrating in those last two lines the effect that he's had. So I guess I'm 
He might be yeah. celebrating himself a little prematurely. <laughs> yeah, but I. But, but otherwise, soon I, he'll be a ghost too. Right, but otherwise, I like the idea. Um, Kamara, what do you think? Um, I sort of agree with what Lily said. The poem of life, that line, just like really threw me. I was like, really? Is this the poem of life? <laughs> um, Could it be but, ironic a little bit? Yeah. No? Yeah, it can maybe be. I mean, if the um, poem is a poem of life, Kamara, mm -hmm. it would not be about pans over the stove and pots on the table. What? The poem of life would be about the big things, because this is a big man, and he does big things. And I think what he's saying basically is, if I give you the poem of my life, it's going to be about being Danes in Denmark. It'll be a, kind of a trivial domestic thing. The most important thing is I can hold that pot. That pot, I can only, I have, just saying it makes me think of reality. I'm, that's, anyway, go ahead. Well, that, that's exactly where I, where I was kind of going, where, like, what I take from this poem is, like, the syllables, if it's law, poesis, poesis, the literal characters. Like, if I want to look at, like, what, what I was confused on in the beginning, like, the rules of poetry, like, all that's around us are, like, the rules that aren't really any limitations at did all. Did you get a final word? I did. How was that? That was great. Good. Yeah, especially the rule part because I come back to law and we're talking about the law of the tabula, but the tabula is changing. Yeah. It's all changing. Well, I've already given a final word, but I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me, and this is not keying off of something that Lily has said, the reader of this poem, we, it's hard to read this poem and not hear in your mind someone reading it aloud or since narrativizing in this poem is someone reading poems aloud, and then having poesis, poesis italicized, and pots and pans be so things as they are-ish in the way that they sound. The reader of this poem is a listener, it seems to me, either figured as a listener or actually listening, maybe reading it aloud or maybe moving your lips. It's the kind of poem where you sort of have to move your lips when you're reading it. And that puts readers, us, in the position of the listeners who are actually in the poem, who are ghosts. And to me, when I re read and reread this poem, all I could think of is, I really want to hang out with the pots and pans before I'm one of these kinds of listeners, needing a poem like this to get access to reality indirectly. I want to take my shoes off and I want to run around in the field or stomp on some grapes because that's a whole lot closer to reality than the meta poem I'll get when I come back and visit the poem who's going to read about life and it's the closest I'm going to get to life. <laughs>